Um, okay, so we'll start with asking the panel to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, Dr. Markham, I'll ask for you first. Okay, thank you for the, for the invitation. I really appreciate being able to come for, uh, for this event. So I'm Kelly Markham, I'm representing Verisite. Um, I joined the company in uh, last May. Uh, prior to that, I was the director of the breast cancer program at uh, Duke University uh, and had been there for most of my career. Uh, do, do you want to talk about our, yeah. I feel like I should introduce Verisite a little bit because many people in the oncology community, particularly medical oncology community, aren't familiar with it, but we're basically a transcriptomics diagnostic company focused in oncology. We have a few things outside of oncology. Uh, we initially uh, last if, uh, acquired from Nanostring the rights for the encounter device for commercialization of assays on that device uh, and are extending a suite of tests um, based on transcriptomics on that technology. But in the last year, I've also acquired a company called Decipher that has uh, GU diagnostic tests as well as a company called Halio DX from France that has a suite of uh, uh, immunoscore in the immune status assessing tests. So we've, we've grown quite a bit over the last year and it's a pleasure to be able to come here and try to get our name out in front of the oncology community. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Markham. Early in my career, I had gone up to Duke and had the, I was jittery meeting Dr. Markham and um, at the time, Kim Blackwell, and I was like feeling so overwhelmed because I before that was just a researcher working under Stefan Gluck at UM, and they were so gracious and kind. So I thank you for coming up. Uh, Dr. Russell, I'd love you to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I'm Christy Russell. I am a medical oncologist, and I'm vice president of medical affairs at Exact Sciences. Um, you may know less about exact sciences than you do genomic health, but a couple of years ago, genomic health was uh, purchased by exact sciences. Um, so it's probably better known for the Oncotype score, uh, referred to earlier um, in the presentation. Uh, but uh, I'll just, and we can probably, every company can probably do this, all the other um, companies that have been acquired. Exact sciences is also known on the screening side for Cologuard. Um, but has recently purchased multiple other companies, including um, we have two different NGS products, a DNA 257 gene, which is called Oncotype Map. We have purchased a company through TGen of Gem Extra, so that's whole exome, whole transcriptome. We have just recently, last week, purchased a hereditary cancer testing company called Prevention Genetics. Um, and we're actively um, working with minimal residual disease, um, et cetera. And I think it's the way many companies are going. And finally, we purchased a company called Thrive, which has a multi-gene <laughs> assay for cancer screening. Um, but really, I think I'm here to, yeah. today on Archetype Breast. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ade? Yes, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am Bill Audi. I am uh, the Chief Medical Officer for Agendia. Uh, I am uh, also a breast medical oncologist. I've been with Agendia almost six years. Prior to that time, uh, I was uh, at the Cedars-Sinai Cancer Center uh, for nearly 30 years, focused on breast cancer and clinical research. Uh, Agendia, as you may know, provides the 70-gene mammoprint assay for risk of recurrence as well as the 80-gene uh, blueprint subtyping assay, uh, both of which are performed on uh, either core biopsy or resection. Uh, as many of the other companies are, are also um, moving into to other areas, we have developed an NGS version uh, of our assays. Uh, we have also developed a digital version of our assays. And uh, we are also very interested in moving into the minimal residual disease area as well, because I think we all recognize that uh, post-treatment, that lengthy period for all women with breast cancer uh, has many unmet needs, and uh, we think uh, intervening in that uh, space uh, may also be helpful. Thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, as you've heard, a lot of people are venturing into minimal residual <laughs> disease, <laughs> but Nitsira, uh is paving the way, and I'd like you to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you uh, for the um, uh, organizer of the event for inviting us um, and welcome everybody. Yeah, my name is Angel Rodriguez. I'm a breast medical oncologist and uh, joined Natera about two years ago. 
Uh, Natera, as you, you probably know, is a, a company that specializes in uh, cell-free DNA um, uh, technology and detection with offerings in non-invasive prenatal testing and organ uh, transplant health uh, uh, sort of rejection. And, and over the last several years uh, have uh, taken advantage of the, our approach to be able to then uh, design an assay called Signatera, which is purposefully built to detect minimal molecular residual disease, which over the last several years, and including back in, in last month in San Antonio, a lot of exciting uh, uh, data coming out with the potential utility of the test to either uh, monitor treatment response in the neoadjuvant setting or uh, assess residual dis molecular residual disease after, after surgery, uh, as well as surveillance monitoring. And so, yeah, very excited to be here um, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Barnett, please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Reagan Barnett, and I am a medical science liaison with Gardent Health. And Gardent is primarily known for our blood-only circulating tumor DNA assays. We are in the advanced cancer space with our Gardent 360 panel, as well as our Gardent response panel now for disease uh, response monitoring. And we also have, uh, just this past year, introduced uh, a test as well in the MRD space, and we're continuing to work towards developing that for uh, other cancer types. Right now it's only available for colorectal cancer, but we are um, vigorously working on expanding uh, that offering as well. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So as I mentioned, we had some prep calls for this session, and you know we kind of kicked around what do we want to talk about and how do we want to set it up? What do we think the learners want to hear the most? And I think what emerged the most was we wanted to talk about gaps and exciting things coming along and kind of where you apply a lot of what each one of these people up here represent uh, through their companies uh, in practical ways and in comprehensive ways for patients. And as we have not just a strong uh, healthcare professional audience, but also a strong patient advocacy audience and patient audience, uh, it's really exciting for us to be able to have this caliber of panel talking about what is here, what's exciting, and what's coming. So having said that, I'm going to, again, ask each panelist to kind of keep their um, answers short and concise as we are, um, we have limited time, but at the same time to kind of give as practitioners and as people out in the field understanding what you need the most applicable information you ha you can on the things that we're going to talk about. So Dr. Aude, I'm going to start with you. Recent studies reveal long-term findings from both MindAct and um, Exact Sciences Rx Bonder, uh, leading to the hypothesis that indirect ovarian function suppression resulting from chemotherapy could explain the difference in distant disease-free survival observed after five years. In particular, a major finding of both trials was that a late benefit of chemotherapy could be observed among the subgroup of women under 50. So my question to you, Doc, is should the role of ovarian function suppression with endocrine therapy be discussed as an alternative to chemotherapy as effective adjuvant therapy in selected premenopausal women with early breast cancer? Well, that, of course, is the main question that's arisen from those large trials, as, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and the findings really were surprising, I think, to anyone uh, dealing uh, uh, with breast cancer, uh, because for, uh, for, for many years we have understood that uh, there is an ovarian function uh, effect uh, of, uh, of chemotherapy. Virtually every premenopausal woman who begins chemotherapy uh, stops her periods, at least for some, uh, some uh, period of time. Um, so the, the finding of um, an improvement in, uh, in outcomes with chemotherapy only in premenopausal women, uh, I think really indicated that that, that was operating uh, in, in these trials. Uh, it, it seemed very difficult for me to believe that uh, uh, women with the same clinical features and the same a, a genomic uh, profile uh, who were pre postmenopausal or over 50 derived absolutely no benefit um, uh, if uh, that was really a function of the, the assays missing something. So I, I think although the way the trials were designed, uh, they could not answer that ovarian function question directly, 
I think all of the many decades of data before that strongly suggest that ovarian function suppression is behind that benefit. Um, and that should be the basis of a discussion with, with women to offer that, uh, understanding that um, the trials didn't answer that question directly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Russell, I'm going to move to you, and since it's a multidisciplinary meeting, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about radiation selection. So retrospective studies have shown that genomic assays that have typically used, been used to assess the need for chemotherapy could also play a role in assessing benefit from radiation therapy. Where does data like this take us in moving closer to personalized medicine? Well, we have um, a, a DCIS score, which is not predictive of radiation therapy benefit. So it's purely prognostic. You can find a group of women with fairly low risk of developing a local recurrence, but she'll still get a relative 50% benefit from radiation. Um, we are using the Oncotype score right now in several trials. One is MA39, which is called Taylor RT, but it's for women with one to three positive lymph nodes to see if women with low Oncotype score have a, a good enough prognosis that they don't need extended nodal radiation. That's a large randomized trial run through the cooperative groups here and the Canadian groups. And then a recently opened DEBRA trial, which is in women with low recurrence score, age over 50, um, lymph node negative, uh, breast conserving surgery without radiation. But I do not believe our score is predictive. However, we've also purchased another assay, which was called PFS Genomics, that will rebrand as Oncotep breast radiation score created by three radiation oncologist, one of whom is Lori Pierce, the prior ASCO president. Uh, that looks like it may be predictive of radiation benefit, but it is still being validated. The first two validation studies look predictive, but don't have the p-value for prediction. Um, the third trial that we're doing right now, it's, they're all retrospective as a Scottish trial. The plan is a meta-analysis of the three trials to see if we can get the p-value for prediction. Um, but uh, if not, we may need to go into a prospective trial to prove it. I, I think we're on the verge of something there, um, but otherwise I think all of these assays at this point are, are purely prognostic to, to find a group with really low risk. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Markham, I'm going to move to you. We just heard Dr. Solomon talk about the breast cancer index. And these gene expression assays have become standard of care to identify which patients can safely avoid chemotherapy or endocrine therapy. But as everybody who's worked in breast cancer can attest to, endocrine therapy can be the more important backbone for women and can also be very difficult to tolerate. Do you see a future where genomic assays can tell you whether a woman might need endocrine therapy at all? Oh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I think we, you know, in the era of personalized medicine, in using these assays, <clears throat> one of the most attractive features is this ability to de-escalate therapy. And certainly Agenda has presented some data on a low risk score. For Verisite, our score is the ProSigna score based on the PAM50 intrinsic subtypes. And, you know, we do have data suggesting that you can identify those very low risk populations. But I think even, even beyond just the question of no endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy, and that is an aspect of all the validation of our genomic assays. We, we always talk about just being prognostic uh, and predicting for chemotherapy benefit, but there is always that endocrine therapy in the background. So in truth, we really are talking about prediction for endocrine therapy as the foundational part of the assays. And I think we, we, we kind of um, blow past that sometimes in thinking about these tests, but I think there's an opportunity both for identifying patients who, who can minimize their endocrine therapy both in duration of treatment, but I think as the landscape of endocrine therapy options gets more and more um, sophisticated and new agents coming on the scene, I think the option of understanding what type of endocrine therapy we can potentially do with these assays as well. Interesting. Thank you. And there, there are other assays that are being developed by other companies. There's a product called SET23 that's sitting out there uh, going through trials of um, endocrine sensitivity. Um, it, but I, I think from all of the data from the genomic companies, we're just, I'm still not convinced that we've seen 
anything other than prognosis, we can all identify a really low risk group of patients. And the question is, what is the endpoint you're going for? Is it survival, um, is breast cancer specific survival? Is it distant recurrence? Um, I don't know, we've just made such strides with tamoxifen for five years in terms of substantially improving the long-term outcomes for women. It's, it's a bigger leap to give up on that yeah. um, and to roll that backwards. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's move a little bit into ctDNA and MRD and comprehensive genomic profiling. Dr. Rodriguez, I'm gonna start with you. So we know kind of the basis of tumor-informed, tumor-naive. That's not where this question's gonna go. It's more about in breast cancer, mm -hmm. what can someone treating a patient with breast cancer expect from ctDNA and MRD today? Yeah. Um, and I'd like to maybe slightly rephrase the question as to like what are the clinically unmet needs as you posted, as right. you asked from the beginning. And, and I think there's, there's some room for improvements when it comes to the, the outcomes of in patients with breast cancer. And you know, when it comes to you know, what is the unmet need, well, you know, you know, mortality remains high you know, with breast cancer and recurrences are occurring. And some of these recurrences can uh, can be serious. And so, is there the opportunity to identify those recurrences early at the uh, minimal disease burden? And can intervention um, uh, intercept that recurrence and prevent that recurrence, thus, you know, preventing long-term death? And so, uh, I think it's important to note that you know, a many clinical trials are, are currently ongoing um, to specifically assess uh, that. Uh, that question both in, in the different subtypes, ER positive or two negative, as well as um, a triple negative breast cancer. And so, uh, you know, today, you know, one of our biggest unmet needs is the higher risk population, the, the triple negative breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer, uh, metaplastic breast cancer. Uh, those, uh, um, those patients that, you know, after we've completed curative intent treatment, we look at stage, we look at treatment response, we look at response to the therapy, and we just have a bad gut feeling about the risk of recurrence. And so the question is, um, some of these patients present with visceral crisis, we need urgent therapy response, you know, can it be advantageous to us to identify that recurrence earlier when it's, um, uh, you know, less symptomatic? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the challenges, I know this isn't, no. <laughs> is that for you know, a lot of the trials we've been doing genomics, we've got tissue, right, from the original cancer. And one of the challenges, I think, with minimal residual disease is until recently, blood has not been stored in these trials. And so it's hard to do anything other than prospective trials to show the clinical utility of MRD. Um, and I go back to the years where we were all practicing and doing CA 153s and CA 2729s, and our hands were being slapped for doing those because it didn't affect the long-term outcome of those patients. And I'm and I'm hoping there's that the MRD is really where we're going to head, and that we can be much more informative, but that we'll also have better drugs to take to these women when we do have these positive findings. I mean, I think about triple negative, and you know, we're kind of playing with you know, keep cytobine right now, but I mean, I would hope we've got more to do if we find out after neoadjuvant therapy that they still have evidence of circulating tumor DNA. We've got more to do um, mm -hmm. to help them survive than our current therapeutics. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the, uh, the opportunity, which always strikes me about this, is that the evidence suggests that with the most sensitive assays for MRD, that we're talking about a cancer cell population that's probably not much bigger than what we treat in the adjuvant setting. Yeah. We, we, we know that there's disease out there in some patients, but the population is so tiny that we can't see it. But yet we also know that with the appropriate treatment, we're eradicating that population. The difference between MRD and the adjuvant setting, of course, is that those, those remaining cells have already seen treatment. So the, the key to, to what, what you're saying, Christy, in, in terms of achieving cure in what is essentially metastatic disease is to step in with the, the right therapeutic intervention. And I think that's really going to be um, the challenge. But it's an opportunity, I think, to essentially cure metastatic breast cancer uh, because of the technology allowing us to detect the residual cancer cell population at such a small 
level that it's still possibly eradicable. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ade and Dr. Russell, for those thoughts, because I think as we go to Dr. Barnett, it's uh, such a great segue into comprehensive genomic profiling. Do you see a time where we move away from thinking of the breast, you know, profiling the breast tumor uh, towards looking at the mutation in the tumor and targeting that, and maybe that's kind of a direction where companies like yours go? Yeah. So. Um and let me just clarify the question that you're wanting to see um, in complete genomic profiling um, if we're going to have more targeted therapies in, in earlier, you know, first line treatments and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see that happen. I think that um, one thing that we need to do first is have a better understanding of the genomics um, of different subtypes. I think that there's a limited understanding there of what mutations are, are going to be different between um, the different breast cancer subtypes, especially in, in triple negative breast cancer. Um, right now, uh, complete genomic profiling is, you know, tar using uh, uh, targeted therapies isn't going to be until a later line. And so using a, a blood only CTDNA test for something like that is going to be more in a progressing patient um, versus in a, in a newly diagnosed patient. And I think, too, um, one of the great areas for, for this would be for patients that maybe are, you know, blood, uh, bone-only disease, patients that, you know, don't have an opportunity to have a complete genomic profiling done with their tissue because they can't receive a biopsy. Um, I think that's a really exciting direction as well um, for this kind of a test. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'll just keep until you say, can you stop doing that? Um, Dr. Russell, my co-moderator for the session. <laughs> well, we've got two NGS products, but I just still struggle with the clinical utility in advanced breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, because we just don't see the large number of variants um, that seem to be targetable, like non-small cell lung cancer, which is, yeah. you know, where that really sits at this point. But other than pick 3 ca um, ESR1, uh, ESR1 kind, of, kind of, but it's really lacking compared to many other cancers where we're just not seeing even these more rare variants come up. And, and I, I think we're spending a lot of money in this breast cancer field, but I think the other solid tumors have much more promise at this point. Which is a fascinating biologic observation. There's no intuitive reason I can think of why that's the case, but it doesn't seem, seem to be. I mean, Fabrice Andre presented the update on the Sapphire study at San Antonio, and I think we could all sit back and go, wow, that's really kind of disappointing. I mean, no, I mean great work, you know, large body of work, but really limited to, to a very small subset of patients that benefit. Things like mutated HER2 I think are exciting, but, but even there it's kind of a rescue operation at that point and it's all, and I think the fact that in early stage disease DNA sequencing per se hasn't really informed treatment decisions is also something I, I wouldn't have predicted 10, 15 years ago when NGS was coming, coming around, so we have a long way to go. Yeah. Is there, do you think that there's, as you're saying, it's not something you could have predicted or would have predicted? Do you think now you kind of see the rationale for it? Is there a way, are there ways for diagnostic companies to kind of observe those gaps and then move in to fill them? Or is it just the behavior of the tumor is so different than some of these other tumor types? Well, I think it's probably going to be an integration of all of our technologies uh, in some way to get the most robust answer to understand the biology. Uh, it is the heterogeneity and the plasticity that we have to contend with as well, and breast yeah. cancer seems to be particularly adept at being able to mutate and go in other directions. Yeah. Dr. Roddy? Yeah, yeah, I guess what I wanted to, I, I wanted to make a, a plug, actually. Um, uh, in about six weeks in Tampa, the AACR will be holding uh, a special session w at which I will be attending um, in which evolutionary biology is being applied to, to cancer. Mm -hmm. And I bring that up because one of the topics is how do you approach the cancer cell population with that in mind? And I think the challenge that we're talking about with advanced breast cancer is that we're dealing with a large genomically diverse population of cells which has so much mutational capacity that virtually anything we throw at it, if, if we're doing it one at a time, will fail eventually. So 
the idea of thinking in terms of ev evolutionary biology is that w we really need to have a different strategy. We, we need to target the pathways that are driving resistance because there may be 10 different points at which a tumor has mutated in that pathway and we need effective you know, uh, treatments to shut that down. But until we change our overall strategy, I think uh, we're, we're not going to make it with single gene targeting. That I think we need to have a, a broader kind of pathway approach and I think that's where I'm curious to see um, what's developing in the evolutionary biology realm. Mm. Dr. Rodriguez, that's actually such an interesting thing because the, the next topic I was going to open, which is very complicated and you know complex, is the idea of diversity. Mm -hmm. So you know what Dr. Ade is saying, where we're looking at this like or taking this evolutionary approach and and applying when you're designing clinical trials. Do you believe that that, you know, having that mass representation of different and diverse groups mm -hmm. in the clinical trial design leads to different answers than we've previously seen? Yeah. So I think, um, so, you know, what's interesting in terms of the, the current and future uh, clinical trial design looking at, uh, you know, the initial sort of clonal um, uh, a bulk of the tumor, um, we see that, you know, over time when you're monitoring that clonal mutation, um, that it'll arise uh, with, uh, and eventually resistant mutations will arise as well, but they will not arise without the, the, uh, the emergence of that clonal truncal mutation. So upon that time that you're seeing that clonal uh, evolution sort of arise, that's when you can query for what are the resistant mutations that are coming up. And I think, it, so in, in terms of the future design of clinical trials, is looking at that ctDNA clearance that you can assess very early on after as early as three weeks or six weeks. Um, and this is also as evidence as two very interesting studies that were presented in San Antonio, the, um, uh, the PADA-1 study and the BioItaly study, that looking at just as early as, as uh, two weeks into starting um, AI of CDK4-6 inhibitor, you can now stratify this patient population into who might do better than others and where you might want to start thinking about uh, stratification for future clinical trial design, mm -hmm. you know, those who don't respond early and those who do. Um, and also, you know, one other, uh, you know, point to make, it just so happens that, you know, today at ASCO GI is, is going to be um, uh, presenting, you know, the, the, the largest uh, prospective um, ctDNA study looking at, at the correlation between ctDNA status postoperatively in, in colorectal cancer with, uh, with long-term outcome. And I think once we, when we, you know, look at that sort of study result, it's going to raise some questions, you know, how is that going to look like within the breast cancer community and what are we going to do moving forward to further improve uh, outcomes? Mm -hmm. Dr. Russell, I'm waiting for my, do you have any comments? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in, in breast cancer specifically, though, many of these mutations and variants are learned um, and under the force of our current therapy. Um, I mean, the, the, I'm a, a fan of the Deterran model, which is this is tumor informed for variants that you've got a lot more sensitivity in, in picking up the, the circulating tumor DNA, but it doesn't give you information about, right, at least right now, all of the new variants um, and, and the way to treat these tumors. I, I think we've just got huge challenges ahead of us yeah. to, to try to do a better job on biopharma development around this, but at least I think we've got the technology behind it to drive the development of new products. Yeah. Um, Dr. Barnett, when, you know, we're, we're in a room full of healthcare um, professionals and, you know, you're an esteemed panel of people who are experts in this area, but how do you, where do you factor kind of community education, patient education into, you know, the end user, the patient being able to understand all the options in front of them mm -hmm. and what it means to treatment, especially in light of, you know, all the nuances that all of you have been discussing. 
Yeah, and I, I am the only non-medical oncologist up here, I believe, so um, I, I don't have a lot of experience, you know, working directly with patients, but in a, in a former life, I did work with a lot of patient advocacy groups. Um, so pa patient education is actually a, a really big um, a really big interest of mine, and I, I do believe that we need to put a lot more emphasis on that. Um, I think that there, if we're not doing it, patients are going to do it for themselves. You know, there are a lot of a lot of um, online groups now, Facebook groups that have just blown up. If we're not giving patients those answers, they're going to look for them somewhere else. They're going to go. Um, they're going to go online. They're going to Google. They're they're going to try to find those those answers. And so, I think developing resources that are easily accessible for patients is um, something that we really do need to put some focus on. Um, obviously, we can't, you know, or you can't as medical oncologists sit there with your patient for hours trying to explain to them, you know, cancer 101, right? Um, but we do need to have um, that information available for them and, and make, make it in different modalities so that it can be accessed. Um, by lots of different age groups and um, different types of patients as well. Um, but I do think patient education is, is going to be important, especially in the genomic era here, um, to make sure that patients are understanding what results they're getting. Yes, for sure. I, I find that there's kind of the, these two categories. I always use my, me and my mom as the examples. My mom was a nurse for 40 years. and. Every time she goes into the doctor, I give her a list of questions to take with her. And then when she comes, I say, what did he say? And she says, oh, I didn't ask him any of them. Yeah. And, you know, it's that, that, like, the doctor will tell me. And then there's me who, like, has all my Google pages open and saying to the doctor, could you look at this? Could you look at this? So I do think there's that kind of gamut of patients that you've got to deal with, contend with when there's this really complex information. Yeah, there are, and you're going to get different types of patients as well, you know, some that don't want any information at all, and you yeah. have to be able to, to find that line of how much information um, should you give them, and then how much is going to be information overload, right? Um, and sometimes that can be really hard to assess in a, you know, 30-minute doctor appointment, yeah. so it's, it's challenging. Yeah, but we do have to find that balance as, you know, they're part of Yep. They're part of the care team. I think one of the greatest things we can do, however, is to make sure there's reimbursement for all these products. Yep. And the greatest gift of patient advocacy is to get these products covered. Um, and I think the advocacy community has been very strong, especially through groups like American Cancer Society, ACS CAN, and uh, many of the, the lobbying groups to go after Medicare and get reimbursement uh, for the genomic assays, especially in advanced disease yeah. uh, right now where mm -hmm. it seems to be really lagging behind. Yeah. But I, I presume all of our companies have patient advocates who are guiding us on creating patient-facing uh, materials. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's well appreciated by, you know, the clinics as well. Okay, let's kind of shift a little bit to the future of practice changing diagnostics. Dr. Markham, I'm gonna start with you. It's kind of an opinion question, but it's a, a big picture vision question too. What do you think it will take to continue to progress into a true personalized or individualized diagnostic profile for women with breast cancer? Well, I alluded to it a little bit in my prior answer. I do think it's going to require integration across the whole central paradigm, you know, RNA, DNA, protein, who knows what else we add in the mix and in its various compartments. Uh, it does touch on the cost issue. We have to be, I think, realistic about how much we spend as well. Uh, but we need, we need better clinical trial designs that have robust short-term readout endpoints that we can rely on. I think that, to me, is one of the most exciting uh, aspects of the whole CTDNA, Bill, you alluded to it, but I think you know, having that as a biomarker that allows you to really uh, read out in real time in an individual patient, you know, what their response is. And because we, you know, we all, we all seek for prediction, right? We, it's good to have prognosis, but we really need things that predict specific therapies, and we need those trial design short-term readout to really be able to personalize things. And I think that, that does touch a little bit on the regulatory space too, and because it's a mess right now, I think we would all admit. And, and we, need, we need to be able to engage with regulatory authorities in a very quick manner in a way that's different than how they review drugs or even other medical devices. You know, the, the, the fact that the oversight of it is still 
um, clustered into therapeutic devices, and it, it really needs to be given a separate treatment. Um, and it's a little bit uh, related to my question for Dr. Russell. I mean, Genomic Health Exact Sciences is known for these really large, long studies. And as we're moving into the future of, you know, maybe funding designs, time designs being different, how do you see us moving away from these, you know, 10,000 patients, 10 years, eight years we'll see the first readout. How do you see us moving away from that into more sophisticated trial design, or, or do you see us moving away from that? Well, I would think, first of all, these large trials were not run by our companies. <laughs> they were run by the cooperative groups. Um, you know, they were partially funded, and, yeah. you know, assays were supporting them. Um, but it is not going to come from our companies. It's really going to come from large cooperative groups uh, and, and their funding sources who also are becoming increasingly intolerant yeah. um, into the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that are being spent. Uh, when, I, when I think, however, of some of the studies that will need to be done even for, I, I know you were looking for someone from Grail here, we've got our Thrive product. You know, these trials that are going to look at cancer screening and genomics for cancer screening are going to need yeah. tens of thousands of patients in them um, because, you know, not everybody gets cancer. You need to have a lot of specificity on your abnormal findings. And so, it, you know, when you're going down that pathway, there's no way to do it other with, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of patients to do these trials. Yeah. But I think we have the opportunity genomic-wise, but I think the promise of MRD as well is, you know, let's get the right patients into these trials who actually do have risks of recurrence um, rather than those patients who we know have excellent prognos prognosis by whatever assay we have. And let's figure out who's going to really relapse and like head with those patients into trials. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, follow-up question. Do you see the role of artificial intelligence in clinical trials playing any significance in either the shortening or design of trials like this, or is it kind of back to bones like we, we had in the past? Well, uh, the AI people are certainly <laughs> they, they want us to believe strong that. proponents <laughs> of it. I, I guess I'm waiting to be convinced. Mm -hmm. um, they're all out there trying to predict the results of all of our assays so that yeah. they can use AI rather than paying for the cost of the assay. but. It's um, the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon is part of the problem, and in having uh, spent some time in the in the clinical informatics, how do I make Epic give me information I can use uh, deployment? Uh, it's a real, it's it's much more challenging than we think, and I think we're going to solve it at some point. But yeah. but that is the aggregation of real world data that AI can then do something with. But just as we have to validate a biologic test, a molecular marker, anything that comes out of an AI predictor has got to be validated too, because models can, I'll, I'll paraphrase Dan Hayes, a bad model is as bad as a bad drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, good points. Uh, Dr. Ade, much focus in recent years has been on de-escalation. I think Antonio Wolf spent a couple of slides after um, the MIND Act, um, uh, presentation kind of redefining de-escalation. Do you believe we should continue to design trials that seek to provide maximum benefit with the least intervention? Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think as you started the, this series of questions, what immediately came to mind when thinking about the future is, is to remember that at least in this country, we're fortunate that the majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer are curable. They're diagnosed at a curable stage, and, and our challenge is not just to find them and not just to cure them, but to cure them with as little damage mm. to them as possible and leave these women with the best quality of life. So what that points to, I think, is to be as sure as possible that we're making the right decision up front at the time of diagnosis, so we never have to deal with MRD. Um, and so refining our decision making at that initial point uh, of uh, uh, de determining who needs which treatment, how aggressive the treatment needs to be, and also identifying those women who do not need aggressive treatment and, and can still have an excellent outcome with less than uh, perhaps what they're being treated with 
uh, right now. So I, I think the history of breast cancer, as everyone in this room knows, is, is a history of overtreatment. Um, uh, treatment's been extraordinarily effective, but has left women with a lot of unnecessary toxicity. So I think there is certainly an opportunity for de-escalation, uh, but there's a huge unmet need for those difficult to treat cancers, the, uh, the triple negatives, for example, uh, or the, the recurrent estrogen receptor positives um, that aren't as sensitive as we thought they were. Uh, uh, still a lot to be done for those difficult subsets that we need to find upfront and treat differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it goes the other way too. And I think you need to think about using any of these genomic products to figure out who we need to accelerate. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're still sitting at the standard of care of what we've been using for decades, and yet we probably have, it's not, you know, probably so black and white, but patients for whom we need to understand their genomics to do better than our current therapies oh, yeah. of AC Taxol. It's not enough. I think we're seeing that with the checkpoint inhibitors and, and triple negative, but that can't be the end either. You know, that moved the needle forward modestly. Um, but, you know, decelerate, but also who can we accelerate appropriate therapies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's truly that personalized. It's looking at the individual and but what's best for her. Um, okay, I'd like to kind of just get a little bit ethereal at this point. Thoughts uh, from ethereal. each of you about um, what are you most excited about? You know, not, maybe not even just as it relates to, you know, what your company is doing, but just being in the breast cancer space. Um, Dr. Brenner, I'm going to start with you. What are you most excited about in the future of genomics? Yeah, I think um, obviously the, the MRD space and the screening space is really exciting. I'm excited to see um, where that goes in breast cancer as well as other cancer types. Um, there's, of course, a lot of good science coming out right now in genomics that has been exciting as well. Um, I believe there's a paper from, I think it was MSK, that came out not too long ago looking at um, how genomics change um, from primary sites to metastatic sites, and um, that paper got me really excited as far as um, potential to use genomics and uh, ctDNA for um, maybe predicting where metastasis is going to occur. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really exciting idea. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of places that we could take ctDNA. I think there's a lot of questions that we could use it to answer. Um, and we're just in the early stages of doing that. We're, we're in the early stages of developing the, those possibilities and looking at clinical trials. And um, I, I think there will be a lot of quick progression mm -hmm. over the years, I, I'm expecting, so. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, same question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should all be very optimistic that, you know, the pace of, of research is going to be, and uh, getting answers is going to be accelerated in a way that we've never seen before. And I think it goes to, from, from you know, starting with, you know, patient selection, and whether it be patient selection because of, you know, residual disease, molecular residual disease detection, or before, you know, right after surgery or after curative intent treatment. And also, the, you know, which we talked about before was that a surrogate endpoint. You know, once we get to that point, if we can show and prove and let the data speak for itself, that clearance of ctDNA ultimately does uh, translate to improved overall survival, I mean, that's basically saying that rather than waiting, you know, three, four years uh, for that, for the, uh, what we call events in clinical trials to happen, uh, we can get that information in just three to six weeks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think uh, both patient enrichment and a surrogate endpoint that is shorter will allow us to um, discover new drugs, uh, which again, it's not just about identifying the right patient, it's about matching them to the right drug in order for, for outcomes to improve. So, I mean, I, I mean the, the future is very bright for, you know, what's to come. That's so wonderful to hear. Dr. Otto, same question. What are you most excited about in the future of genomics? Yes, well, I, I think uh, I'm still focused on that initial point of diagnosis because I think the genome of, that, of the breast cancer 
at Diagnosis has much more information uh, than, than we've tapped into so far. But we have a, an incredible platform and technology to, to, to get that information. And I'm struck, um, at least in principle, by the example of the Olympia trial, mm -hmm. um, that this changed the standard of care for an, a subset of breast cancer patients who were known to have BRCA mutations. And that added a new drug, which had been developed previously, uh, into the standard of care and improved outcomes. It, it was, in a sense, further stratifying women at diagnosis by understanding more about the genomics of their cancer. And I think that's just the beginning. I think we're going to use genomics at diagnosis to further stratify and add treatments or change treatments so that we get better outcomes and higher cure rates with more personalized medicine. Uh, because I think we've just scratched the surface of what the genome can tell us um, about breast cancer. Thank you. Dr. Russell? Prevention. Mm. I, I think taking it back earlier. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what will happen to these um, large screening uh, genomic tests um, for earlier diagnosis, and that may cure people who currently are not being cured for malignancies that can't be screened. But I think the whole hereditary gene testing and then prevention testing and understanding the genomics of normal um, and then understanding uh, prevention into the future. It's going to take genomics to do that. Um, but I, I think that pulls us back even further than waiting for the original diagnosis and, and trying to understand the genome at that time. Mm -hmm. It's a little married, too, because, you know, as much prevention as te techniques or tactics, some women are just going to have cancer. So when you have that double step where you're, you know, looking at prevention as the first kind of barrier, but then move into early stage, getting to a better understanding. I think all the way through, all the, all the panelists have said it's building blocks for the patient ultimately. Well, we have great prevention drugs right now for breast cancer yeah. that aren't utilized. Yeah. So yeah. it's not only understanding um, pharmaceuticals that can help prevent cancers, but it's then targeting who needs to have prevention yeah. um, and then how to um, convince people that they need the prevention. Um, and then how to reduce morbidity from it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Markham, what are you most excited about in the future of genomics? Well, tying together many of the answers that have been given, I, I, I do want to go back and uh, revise my answer a little bit about the clinical informatics part because I actually am still excited about that. Yeah. I think uh, even when we do large randomized trials, we have to acknowledge the limitations of the patients who end up in those trials, and we, we ultimately need real-world evidence, mass data, to be able to, to, to see how genomic information maps on entire populations. Uh, and then I'll, I'll give the inverse answer a little bit about these screening tests. I, I do think we have to be very careful about not overpromising and not causing unintended harm because there's absolutely the risk for unintended harm in mass population screening for cancers with tests based. I mean, it gets into the statistics of population prevalence and false positives, and we all, you know, we all learn these things over the course of our careers, but they're very real, and you don't want to tell somebody you've got cancer, but they just can't find it yet. You're not really helping them, most likely. But I think, going to Bill's answer then, I, I you know, this, this it's, it's an amazing time to be in human history where we've had these molecular tools now for two decades that we really are approaching, you can see it every year at San Antonio, we're approaching this kind of unified field theory of biology of cancer, where, where these kind of single gene, I remember, you know, back in the 90s, people would study their single gene and their whole world revolved around their single gene and, that, and how it worked in the cell. But now, you know, we're so far past that as we really can put all the pathways together to begin to understand, you know, these evolutionary pathways that cancer cells take. Well, they're not infinite. I mean, there have to be a limited number of ways that, that these things can change. And so it is definable, it is knowable, and we have the tools now to be able to do it. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, we've got about six or seven minutes remaining. I'd love to open to questions. Sir, uh, just speak loud. We're not doing microphones unless you use the Q&A. Well,
Dr. Rodriguez, if you would repeat for the yeah, virtual. So, so the question is about the, uh, the specificity of circulating tumor cells as well as uh, tumor markers and uh, acknowledging that the current guidelines in breast cancer from ASCO, both NCCN, uh, tell us to not do surveillance CAT scans, not do tumor markers. I want to clarify something very important. Right? Most of us have not been talking about circulating tumor cells but rather circulating tumor DNA, uh, which is a very important distinction. Um, we, we acknowledge that yeah, circulating tumor cells is a, a different technology that has its sort of challenges and, and data that relate to its uh, specificity and, and sensitivity. Now, uh, when it comes to circulating tumor DNA, for the most part, what we've been talking about are sort of these, um, you know, an, an, an assay that is purposefully built to have high specificity based on the genomic profile of each patient's tumor. So when we're talking about uh, the CT DNA, we're talking about a specificity of 98%. You know, so it basically overcomes some of the challenges that we have faced in the past with markers like 27, 29 like circulating tumor cells, and even CAT scans, which you know, can lead to incidental lomas and ultimately lead to patient harm. So that's where we are really re-asking the question of surveillance in breast cancer, which is one of the focus of an oral presentation from uh, Nick Turner, Imperial College of London, where basically looking at circulating tumor DNA surveillance in a population of about 160 patients with triple negative breast cancer. So because of this new powerful tool, it is worthwhile to re-ask the question, does CT DNA early detection, early intervention with therapeutic intervention, you know, can that impact uh, patient survival? So I hope I mainly answered the question by distinguishing the poor specificity of, of tumor markers, CTCs, uh, and, and what we're talking about here, more specific CT DNA, and would love to have any other sort of anybody in the panel comment on that too. Question: Can a 24-year-old tumor be tested? Yes. For what? <laughs> <laughs> With the correct yes. answer. To yes. Yes. Uh, yes. With all the. You know, most of our tests were validated in retrospective specimens that were quite old, and there's a lot of RNA that sits in paraffin blocks, so um, it's more volume of cancer than it is age of it. Well, that's screening, and I think um, those technologies are j just emerging and going through massive clinical trials to understand whether we can use genomics for screening and if it's specific enough that if you have a finding that it's going to be cancer. Any other questions from our audience? The question first is, has anyone read an editorial by Dr. Mukherjee, and what do you think? I've read lots of editorials. Which one? The one that he just recently published in the Wall Street Journal, which was sort of amazing, but basically putting it out there as to whether or not this, the field of cancer genomics, as is being presented now, what that's doing for the general population with putting them in cancer land or cancer crazy. Yeah, I, I read that was in the Wall Street Journal, I think, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that he was focused on the idea that high-tech information that lacked specificity was only going to generate anxiety. And, and, and I think that's, I don't disagree with that, but my worry about someone with his high profile talking about science in that way is that it, it throws a chill on the, on the science. It, it, it causes people to paint all of that field with the same brush, which I think is counterproductive. Uh, I, I think, as, as Dr. Russell 
said, the, 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 the um, detection uh, technology is rapidly improving and there's a lot of people working on it and it will become much more specific than what, to what he was referring. So I, I think, I'm not sure that that was a helpful comment that he made. I don't know, did you see it? I did not. Uh, I think it sounds like it does highlight, you know, our responsibility to educate, you know, yeah. both, you know, pre-testing and post-testing and making sure that, you know, patients who are receiving these results, like, truly do understand what, what this means and what this doesn't mean, right? So uh, I think it's on us to explain, you know, results when they do, when we do order them. Dr. Russell, I have a question um, from, from the virtual audience. It's from a patient. Are there additional testing, are there additional tests to find out why a new occurrence occurred after two and a half years after the last occurrence? Tamoxifen was being taken all along and full genetic te testing including BRAC was all negative. Well, I think we're, we're talking about any of these tests to try to understand First of all, any of the genomic assays that we're talking about are, are not 100% proving that patients who are at good risk will not recur um, or who are at poor risk will recur. Uh, these are, are not that black and white. Mm -hmm. um, they're categorizing people into higher and lower risk. Um, and so when it comes down to an individual and her cancer, why did she relapse when she was low risk or high risk or on what we thought was the appropriate therapy? It's going to come down to the genomics of her cancer um, and why that occurred. Do we have the best technology to understand that? I'm not sure, but we're, we're certainly heading in that direction. We may find all sorts of variants. It doesn't mean that that was the driver of her recurrence. Yeah. Um, and I think the tumor microenvironment and well, her- Well, one thing that was hot five, six years ago, but now it's kind of gone quiet as pharmacogenomics, which yeah. I think by this point we all would have, would have thought that we would have had our tamoxifen metabolism panel of genes that we would be getting, I still wonder, in someone like this who develops a new second primary recurrence, were they activating their tamoxifen at all if that's what they were taking? Uh, because we know that, that there is significant individual variation. So there's so many parameters that can be looked at. And this does touch some on the, you know, all the trial designs, the endpoints of, is it a new cancer in the other breast or recurrence in the breast or a distant recurrence? Mm -hmm. We get confused over the, well, I certainly get confused. You probably don't, Christy. But uh, <laughs> you know, the def definition of the endpoints in the trials right. and right. what gets wrapped up in them is a somewhat complicated table. Sarah Tolani tried to, again, clarify it for us recently at JCO. And I, you know, but that, that's an important thing to think about, too, and how we think about the data from all of our tests. Yeah, and as a patient, I think what Dr. Rodriguez said just a minute ago is so important. Like for this particular patient, a lot of times you're looking for, did I do something wrong? Did I pick the wrong test? Did I not ask the doctor the right question? And so what Dr. Rodriguez was saying earlier, we've got to do a better job at telling patients and educating what this does and what it doesn't do. And like what Dr. Russell said, it, it's not perfect. So we're gonna use all of this information, you know, as a team, including the patient, um, to make the best decisions with the information we have now. And things may change, but, you know, not to kind of dwell on those questions about, did I do the right thing? Or, you know, was what we picked the right thing? Because it was what we picked. So I thank you for the virtual audience um, asking questions. That concludes our session. I know I could personally go on with this panel for the rest of the day. Um, I'm sure they have flights to catch or other things to do, but um, I really appreciate all of you being here. Um, I know you've come from far distances to be here. It's exciting for us as it's our first back to in person to have all of you here, and I thank for everyone watching. It was very informative and kind of, you know, it was nice to have you in our living rooms and with us because you, you all represent really exciting things happening in the breast cancer space. So I thank you all for your time with us Thank this you. morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.